morning. So, um, oops, yeah. Uh, <coughs> I will make a, a new uh, presentation on uh, antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy. It will be as uh, was it indicated um, a much more well I actually exclusively on development, not research. So it will be a, a, a helicopter view of uh, the current trends uh, of, the, of uh, the development and of the market also. And I do believe that we are start of a new area for antimicrobial and anti-cancer therapies. Right. Right. And uh, actually, anti-cancer therapies. We are right in, the, in, uh, in uh, this new area, and antimicrobial may come in a new, uh, in a recent future. <coughs> so, uh, what is the situation and the history? Um, <coughs> for uh, anti-cancer uh, agents, there were quite a lot of discoveries, and we will see that again afterwards. Until the 70s, uh, until the 70s, we say the toxics. And then there was almost nothing until the early mid 90s. There was a first boom in the 90s with the appearance of the antibodies. Actually, it's more the end of the 90s. Uh, a boom in the 2000s uh, with the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And since uh, 2013, uh, a boom with immunomodulators. If we look at antimicrobial agents, actually, uh, new discoveries or new classes. Have been uh, discoveries have been very limited since the 70s and 80s. Uh, there are uh, very marked differences in terms of incentives, uh, in, in general incentives for development of, uh, of uh, new agents. Uh, Anti-cancer agents, the markets are mainly in, in uh, developed countries. Uh, Antimicrobial Microbial agents, of course, it's developed countries, but the main needs for new treatments and the main needs due to the resistance is mainly in developing countries. Uh, existing drugs are already at high prices, so you can expect to have a very good price for, with an anti-cancer agent. Uh, with antimicrobial agents, it's much more difficult because the drugs are were developed in the 70s, 80s, so the price are very low. So get a, a high price for a particular agent is very difficult. Um, currently, it's a huge boom uh, in anti-cancer agents, so all the major players are in anti-cancers, whereas quite a lot of major players have exited the antimicrobial um, area. And this is the black, black painted figure for antimicrobial agents, but the future may not look like this. Probably will not look like this. Uh, in terms of, um, of, uh, <coughs> of types of, uh, of drugs, uh, the, and, and this is true for both, uh, actually, for antibiotics and, uh, and uh, antimicrobial agents, at the, the, the very beginning, well, it was mainly cytotoxic, cytostatics, either for, against cancer or against, uh, <coughs> against um, bacteria, whatever. Uh, more recently, I mean, from the 90s, uh, the antiphysiologic and metabolic drugs have been developed um, thanks to the understanding of the intracellular mechanism that we didn't know before. Uh, and so mainly, uh, for instance, this was the, uh, the, uh, the reasons for the development of the discovery of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, which are mainly anti-cancer drugs. Um, I'm not specialized in, in um, antimicrobial agents, so I don't know. I don't have the impression that this area has led to the, the development and, and the marketing of new antimicrobial agents through the better understanding of the intras, uh, further understanding of the intracellular mechanism, and if tyrosine kinase inhibitors or things like that could have been developed. What has been uh, quite um, what is quite, quite hot currently is uh, immunomodulation, uh, mainly anti-cancer, and I'm wondering if there is a future in, in antimicrobials, I'm very specializing in this aspect. Um, but basically, both uh, cancer and, and microbial infections are basically, in principle, and, and 
very simply said, uh, absolutely identical in the way it's an abnormal invasion of cell, abnormal invasion the development of cells in the body, that the body and the immune system is not uh, able to, uh, <coughs> to uh, destroy and, and to uh, eliminate. So basically, it's, it's quite the same concept. It's, it's quite the same area. It's very different from a CNN, from cardiovascular, or whatever, but it's very close in terms of, of its cells. The only, well, the only, the very difference is that it's different cells, different in nature, and, and um, structure, physiology, metabolism, and, and growth. Uh, <coughs> so, what is what, what we are currently for with anti cancer uh, treatments? Um, we have um, it's getting more and more cancer specific, really cancer specific, with the more uh, earlier de detections through uh, through uh, through diagnostic trying to do to, to 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 get earlier detection. Uh, reduce uh, reduce the resistance, uh, uh, and uh, we have also treatment specific uh, uh, drugs with um, uh, increased efficacy and a reduced drug development uh, cost. Uh, for for the types of and that's for the diagnostic diagnostics. Uh, that's the consequences. I mean, if you we, you do we, we probably know what what diagnostics are. It's diagnostics. Uh, linked to uh, treatments that can detect, uh, either de detect early the disease, but also detect patients who will be benefit, most probably benefit from the drug. And that enables to, to reduce the, the cost, or well, the society, society cost of the, of the drug uh, for two reasons. One, the, uh, the, 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 the development uh, clinical trials are smaller, so less expensive. And second, um, as uh, you administer that only to patients who can benefit from it, well, almost in theory at least, uh, the total cost of the society is, is less. And, and third, also you have a kind of a res uh, reduction of the resistance risk because you expose less people to, to the drug. Uh, with new drugs, uh, it's been mainly statics and, and toxics, uh, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, thousand kinase inhibitors coming uh, in the last 20 years. And currently, what is very uh, investigated is, is even with radiation. And the picture looks pretty much the same for antimicrobial agents, where uh, there is a, also a, a lot of uh, efforts in, in diagnostic and diagnostics with the same potential uh, benefits, uh, maybe actually much higher benefits uh, in, in, in antimicrobial agents uh, for reduction of the risk of resistance. But also regarding uh, the new drugs, statics and toxics have been largely investigated. Um, now, uh, new areas have been and, and should be much further uh, investigated, but also in, the, in my sense, immunomodulation should be investigated. Sorry. Um, so, what's the kind of a, what's the situation with the anti-cancer agents? Well, there is a lot of uh, a huge market incentive with uh, anti-cancer uh, treatments. Uh, if you look here, actually the average drug treatment price for anti-cancer drug in the U.S. is $66,000 uh, <clears throat> for a benefit of uh, average survival benefit of 0.46 uh, years. It means that it's a very, very high cost, very much incentive, but also that the target benefit of 0.5 years is almost nothing, meaning that the regulatory Context for anti cancer drug is relatively, I say, relatively um, uh, <coughs> brackets easy in that you have to demonstrate an advantage, but it has not to be a huge advantage. And this does impact quite a lot on, on the clinical trials and also on the attractiveness of, of, of the drug because uh, of, of, of anti cancer drug, <coughs> because for instance, with antimicrobial agents. Uh, you are where well, currently, and it's changing. You you currently have the same requirements as for any other drug besides cancer drugs, where you have to make uh, to, to demonstrate 
a strong difference, a strong ben benefit versus versus um, a reference drive or a placebo, meaning that you have huge trials. Whereas in cancer, as you have to demonstrate, usually it's even not against placebo. You don't need a placebo in, in that cancer drive. Maybe a reference drive. The 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 the, the, the cancer uh, the uh, <coughs> the cancer uh, phase three trials are usually be, be, be between 500 and a very big maximum of 1,500 patients, which is very low. Whereas for all other drugs, you can usually it's thousands of patients in phase threes. So it's much higher cost for developing other drugs, and a much lower drug cost for developing anti-cancer drugs with a very high price. So it's extremely attractive. Sorry for the noise. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is actually the same, uh, but what you, you see also that is, uh, there is a steady in increase in, in, uh, in the price of the drug. There is also a steady increase in the survival, but definitely it's, there is a steady increase in, in, in the price of, of the drug. Uh, in 2012, there were uh, <coughs> nine, uh, nine or ten, I don't remember, uh, ten new drugs that were uh, were uh, approved by the FDA. Most of them come from new families of compounds, really, um, specific uh, antibodies. Uh, well, anti VEGFR FR is a, a known uh, a family for the time being, but still has, has some development. But for instance, you have a, a this is a brand new uh, area with the anti-PDL1, which are immuno immunomodulators, uh, and anti-PD1 also, uh, PI3P, uh, PI3K, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's very active. If you look in the same period in uh, antimicrobial agents, actually, wow, well, there have been drugs approved, but basically almost, I would say, nothing new. Um, it's mainly uh, combinations or also or formulations, or things like that, but really breakthrough new uh, approaches um, are, are rare. Um, going back to the uh, history of uh, anti-cancer treatments, uh, well, amongst the first drugs that have been developed back in the 40s, it's uh, nitrogen mustard uh, uh, <coughs> anti-cancer drugs. Actually, these drugs come from uh, combat gases of the First World War. It's a mustard, a mustard uh, gases. Then there's been different the difference of uh, antifolates, purines, and so on and so forth, methotrexate. But it's mainly cytotoxics, uh, drugs that uh, act on, on the uh, regeneration of, of, of the drugs. Then, <coughs> Almost 70s, 75, 80, 85, almost nothing. I would say nothing, actually. And it's only from the middle and uh, at the 90s, well, research has been from the early, it's really in the 90s, that you had the first boom with uh, the first uh, monoclonal antibodies and the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And here it's a kind of a very first revolution, really a revolution, uh, because actually we are, we are attacking the, the cells, attacking the cells in a very different way. And it's the first time that we are beginning to have hope of cures of the cancer, that is really eliminating the cancers. Uh, the the terrans and kinase inhibitors have really boomed in, in the 2000s. Uh, to well, they are still booming, 2005, and it's only very recently, in 2013, that immunomodulators are booming. This is not exactly true, because there was already one immunomodulator, which is back in 1992, which is interleukin 2, but this has been considered as a real failure, and, and this, this area has been totally abandoned, or even considered as, as, as a dead end. It's only very recently that, uh, with the anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1, that there is a real boom and that there is a real hope of uh, increasing the number of 
patients with a total eradication of their cancer. Now we are talking of a, not, not only an increase of a couple of months in survival average to, to the patients, some having six months, some having the, the zeros. Here we are beginning to talk about an increase in percentage of patients who are totally cured, that is, have their cancer eradicated, and it's getting from 5% to 30, 35%. And so it's, it's really a new area. We are, I, I go, close to hopefully uh, have a, an eradication of at, at least some cancers. But what, what I want to, to stress here, sorry, uh, where, yeah, to stress here is like, kind of like in, in antibiotic. It's, it, there's been a, a long period where almost nothing happened. And all of a sudden, uh, everything has been booming. It's quite a lot due to the, <coughs> quite a lot due to the, uh, to the uh, incentives. Well, with the ant antibiotics, as mentioned, there have been 14 classes, new classes, between 35 to 68. And since then, there have been only five class classes, which is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, limited. Actually, we, we are, we still are with antibiotics. Of course, there have been new classes, but not so many. And we are still are kind of a, in the situation where anti-cancer drugs have been between the 70s and the 2000s. And, and, but a very reason for that is that uh, the cost of a, uh, sorry, just in comparison, uh, during in 2014, uh, during the same period, sorry, not 2014, you, uh, sorry, bet between, uh, sorry, <coughs> since uh, like the, since 2000 and 2014, uh, there have only been two first-in-class drugs, whereas uh, there have been <coughs> um, 19 other compounds for anti-cancer agents, of which half of them were first-in-class. So uh, what is the reason for this kind of a situation uh, uh, with uh, antibiotics? First, uh, the, the, it's the low, low price of existing treatments, which are efficacious treatments in most of the cases. And we meaning that if you want to develop a new drug, uh, because they are efficacious, you have to compare your new drug to them, meaning pretty big. Uh, the clinical trials and, and very high costs. And, and so you cannot expect to have a good return on investment. Uh, it's mainly in developing countries where the need for new drugs is, exists. And as I mentioned, the major players have existed uh, for the same reason as before, as mentioned before. However, sorry? Ah, okay. okay. However, uh, <coughs> situation may be changing now uh, because uh, there is a huge increase in, in multi drug resistance and cross <coughs> resistance, uh, which has placed uh, the antibiotic drug market <coughs> back in the spotlight, meaning that it might again attract the, uh, the, <coughs> the, um, attract the, uh, the industry to it. Never forget that, of course, uh, the industry is interested mainly by the return on investments and not just by the pleasure of, uh, of uh, the treating patients. Um, it, and it's not an only a, a problem in developing countries. And this is coming, this, these pictures are coming from the European Commission, meaning that there is a beginning, well, not beginning, but it's, there is a strong uh, and, and increasing pressure uh, political pressure uh, that is uh, an awareness of, of, the, uh, of the risk also in developing countries, what could help actually to go <coughs> further in, in the discovery and development of new drugs? Here you see what is just a share Shiakoni, but it's interesting because it, got, it can also be uh, very pathogenic. And what you see is that resistance were relatively limited, but just in three years, look at the number of countries and, and the increase in in in, uh, in, in, uh, in resistance, and as you know, we travel a lot, so the the uh, the spread of the resistance is extremely rapid in our in our uh, civilization. 
for instance, uh, here it's uh, with the acetobacter. Uh, what we see is that there is already a very strong to extremely strong resistance uh, also uh, in, in mainly in, in southern southern uh, countries, but it's beginning to be strong in, in other developed countries. And I would not be surprised that today or next year, actually, these green countries like France or whatever are already uh, <coughs> uh, yellow or even even red due to the uh, the travel of the people. So it's getting, it's beginning to be a real, real problem, not only for developing countries, but also for uh, developed countries, if you can consider Europe as a developed country, related to Canada, I don't know. But that's another <laughs> aspect. And, uh, <coughs> um, and, and there is also a, a political uh, understanding that this is this can be and, and may be a, a very, very uh, important, uh, important problem because it will have an impact on, on, on the deaths much more than cancer today has. Um, and, and, and it's expected to, that the, uh, the death due to uh, drug resistance in the 50s may become one of the uh, major, if not the major cause of deaths Whereas today it's cancer and not infection, but it's projected that in 40 years from now, or less than 40 years from now, uh, infections due to uh, deaths due to multi drug resistance, the drug resistance will be the first uh, will be the first cause of deaths, um, and also this will have a huge impact on on the global economy of, of the countries. As you see, this is the uh, <coughs> the uh, the loss uh, the loss of the Fiji of the economy of the, of the countries. So there are, it's, there is more and more political awareness of where we are going to, and that there is a huge need and an urgent need for new antimicrobial agents, especially against uh, gram-negative, uh, against resistance against uh, gram-negative bacteria. So, <coughs> as I mentioned, currently, well, currently up to a couple of years ago, the, the very limitations of the development, of the discovery and development of new antimicrobial agents was the fact that there was not a lot of a financial incentive for going for developing new, new drugs. Also that the regulatory requirement, meaning what you need to uh, <coughs> to have your, your drug on the, the drug on the market uh, were still extremely uh, high for uh, antimicrobial agents, where, whereas they have been much 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 lower uh, <coughs> for uh, anti anti uh, anti cancer agents, and of course they are the scientific challenges. <coughs> but um, just to come back also to the uh, market challenge. Uh, the what we call the net present uh, value in antibiotic. The net present value is what you you invest in, in the development and what you can expect in return. Currently, it's considered as a for an, an antibiotic due to the limitations that I meant about I talked about. It's minus fifty million, meaning that it's not interesting to go into there. It's better to put your money, the money in the bank. Whereas for for instance for a musculus. Uh, skeletal drug, it's, it's one billion. So there is a problem here. So uh, the gov different governments, US, Europe, are beginning to put in, on, uh, in a new um, uh, regulations and incentives. One of them is the what is called the, the GAIN, which is generating antibiotic incentives now, and, uh, which I know we detailed a bit before, but it's also, it, it gives a product, product exclusivity, meaning that your drug is projected longer than the expiration of, 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 uh, of its patent. Just also, and, I'm, I'm, and I think these figures are, well, this one is, is right, but um, I think that the next one, which is the current vision that, that is seen by, by the marketers, uh, by the markets, uh, is probably not right. Currently, the the oncology market is really the biggest market uh, in, in the industry. Antivirals are not bad, but antibacterials are 
even if it's quite a lot of people, but given that the drugs themselves are of low price, the, the market is market value is low. And <clears throat> these are the projections uh, to the 12, to the 18. It may be true for 2012, 2018, but um, I think that the this evolution will change uh, in the future. First, uh, there is an increase, of course, uh, in the value of the oncology market, uh, but um, um, I fear that there will be a slowdown of the oncology market uh, for two reasons. One, uh, as I mentioned, each treatment is sixty-five thousand dollars and the country's economies uh, can accept up to a certain amount of uh, spending in Paris at some certain point it will not be possible really to accommodate with much higher prices. Uh, there are many drugs coming in, so it's a huge increase in cost of oncology treatments, and we are possibly getting towards kind of the end of a golden area of this country. Whereas uh, for the next one or two years, and, and I'm talking about markets here, I'm talking about drugs that are, are on the market. Uh, it's expected that the market is, uh, remains, the, incre the evolution of the market is low, but it doesn't mean that the research and discovery, uh, not a lot is done. It may be that, that uh, after 2018, the, uh, the increase in the antibacterial market uh, will, will, uh, will be will shift to the next most probably. <coughs> um, so, as I mentioned, uh, in the US, uh, they have introduced uh, uh, the gain, uh, the gain, uh, the gain, uh, how do we say that, uh, rules, and that was back in, uh, I think, four years ago. And, and, and since then, there have been uh, 37 uh, antibiotics in development, uh, 10 in phase one, 18 in phase two. In phase three and one uh, has come. Uh, they have also what they design as qualified infectious disease product, meaning that these get uh, regulatory advantages. Um, and maybe a bit after I don't remember, but at least uh, a, a faster review, a lower requirements for uh, for demonstration of the benefits, and also. Uh, incentive regarding the, uh, the duration of the protection. Uh, currently, there are approximately in the US 32 companies with antibiotics in clinical development, um, which was not the case uh, before. However, it's still only five, uh, five big ph uh, pharma companies. <laughs> and uh, they, almost 80% of the drugs are currently developed by small companies, <laughs> by biotechs. Uh, in Europe, uh, there have been there are different uh, action plans uh, that are beginning to uh, to be implemented. Um, results are not so clear as in the US, but also maybe because the uh, the tools for identifying the re results are are different. And as you see, uh, there is an innovative medicine initiative, FP7, that has been really targe that targets really uh, antibiotics with four programs that are trying to develop uh, and to reduce, to increase the uh, attractiveness of the development of new uh, incentives. Um, for instance, also, uh, <coughs> uh, also regarding uh, the, uh, the um, designing and implementing efficient clinical trials for new anti novel antibiotics, meaning that they are trying to reduce the requirements, regulatory requirements for the size of the studies here that you need, meaning that it will be less expensive to develop, uh, so more attractive. <coughs> they also, and this is very recent, uh, they set up a global action plan against the rising threats for antimicrobial resistance. And this plan actually is, is um, sorry, uh, this plan is, is, uh, is large, it's towards, uh, of course, the development of new antimicrobial drugs, but also the better use of existing drugs and so on and so forth diagnostics and so on. Um, so uh, if we look at the regulatory incentives, uh, first uh, you have the goal is to expedite to, to shorten and to reduce the cost of the development of a new antibiotic for it being put in the market. So they get the priority review, fast track designation. Um, 
the increase in in uh, protection on the market, which is quite quite uh, quite attractive, because it means that you don't have generates uh, in, in too early. And currently, there have been uh, 52 drugs that have already been qualified as qualified infectious disease products. Uh, they have also reduced the guidelines for clinical antibiotic trials. Uh, <coughs> Uh, currently, uh, patients could not have had uh, an antibiotic treatment practically within two or three months before. Now they can they can be uh, have been treated, and and that's good because it means that it's much easier to recruit patients. The second is also uh, they are regarding as the organism specific rather than disease specific studies, meaning that if. <coughs> I, I, I don't know, for, for instance, let's say uh, it's that Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus. Well, <coughs> Staphylococcus aureus can, can generate different diseases. <coughs> so you can have in that study, before that, you had to have the study in that disease with Staphylococcus uh, aureus. And if it was another disease with, uh, with Staphylococcus aureus, you had to have another study. Now. If it is Staphylococcus aureus, you can have one, two, or three diseases, meaning that it's much easier and much less costly also to recruit patients. But also it means that once your drug become, comes on the market, it would be marketed on all these diseases. Uh, <coughs> if they also are, have uh, <coughs> kind of used what, uh, what, what is used actually for often drug diseases uh, to accept small studies in support of a, of a phase three. Currently, you have to make two phase threes to be approved, which are large trials. Now you can make one phase three and use phase two studies to support the approval. And even in very critical situations, only phase two studies may be uh, sufficient. And uh, <coughs> of course, it's also, well, this is a bit technical, but it's, uh, it's much less um, uh, stringent in terms of, of proof of efficacy. So, as you see, and that was kind of a, the goal of the, well, yeah, the goal of the presentation is to see, say that uh, <coughs> it's both families that are going, and it's it's both contexts that are well, diseases, cancer and antimicrobial diseases that are quite in the same context. He said that the, the, the evolution of them has been different, um, but in both of them there has been a, a real gap uh, from the end of uh, the 70s with cancer treatments due to market incentives, due to quite a lot of things, but especially market uh, regulatory incentives. Uh, there has been a boom in the development of, of new drugs and we possibly are coming towards an area of, uh, of, um, of cure the cancer. It's not been the same for antimicrobial agents, but there is a, a strong political understanding that this uh, uh, <coughs> antimicrobial infection may be the major cause of, uh, of this in the near future. So there is a huge uh, pressure in order to, uh, to increase the incentives, uh, the attractiveness of, of the antibiotics. And it may work very well be that in the next couple of years, uh, the, the speed of the, of the new drug of, uh, of, uh, in, in, of microbials may be as, as, as uh, important as, as what we have seen with, with cancer drugs. But also, what, one of the things is probably that thanks to this, uh, thanks to these incentives, also quite a lot of bridges, more bridges could be developed between the two types of treatments, for instance, with a um, um, <coughs> kinase inhibitors or with immunotherapy and, and other drugs. So that's basically the uh, record of you I wanted to, to show. So I thank you very much for this clear and comprehensive um, presentation of the global picture of drug developments. And I have and I hope also you have a better understanding of the new era of cancer, of cancer and also of antimicrobial therapies. <coughs> and we have time for, the, for questions. We are not so numerous. So yeah. Just feel free to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
My name is Veronica Ofia mm -hmm. from the University of the West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. Please, my question is uh, it is known that for anti cancer drugs, the major problem is resistance and toxicity. All these new developments, are they trying to reduce those? Because. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <coughs> Actually, uh, as we see now, regarding resistance, I'll uh, talk about toxicity afterwards. Currently, uh, the <clears throat> what, what we see now is that we are increasing the percentage of patients cured. And actually, the um, progressive disease, or rather the recurrence of cancer, what in the end kills the person is mainly due to the resistance of the cancer. because. Uh, in, in cancer, it's a bit, maybe a bit different in that uh, you have kind of a bird tumor that is kind of major cancer, uh, major cancer drugs that are very, very, uh, very sensitive, or that are sensitive to, to usual cytotoxics and radiotherapy. Uh, but you have one to five percent of what we call cancer stem cells, so cancer initiating cells, <coughs> which are very virulent, I would say. Uh, uh, cells that are pretty much resistant to uh, usual classic cytotoxics or radiotherapy and that are responsible for the recurrence or responsible for, uh, for the metastasis. So it's kind of resistance if you make a parallel with, with, uh, with bacteria. And it's, it's resistant cells. And uh, currently, quite a lot of effort is made, made against this resistance in order to, to increase the efficacy of cancer. But what, and, and one of the most efficient uh, tools against resistance is the immune system. The immune system is not very good at, uh, at killing the big, uh, the, the big uh, infection, let's say, the, the, the big tumor. It might not be very efficient at, uh, at um, <coughs> eliminating the bulk of the disease, but it's very efficient at at uh, attacking attacking uh, residual diseases, and so quite an, an effort is made in, in, in this area. So talking about toxicity, yes, well, uh, it's a limitation, and here an effort, efforts are made in kind of a different way because you have toxicity due to the structure of the drug, but you have toxicity due to the mode of action, and sometimes you just kind of separate them, or you may modulate them by just a bit. Quite a lot of efforts is made, also, of course, in, in that sense. <coughs> and, uh, and again, if we take um, if we take um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for instance, the toxicity is much much less than than cytotoxics because the mode of action is very different, and then and in, in the end you, you don't have the same toxicity as you had in cytotoxics. Uh, if we go if we talk about immunotherapy currently. Um, the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-4, anti-PD-1. Uh, actually, any cancer, any viral infection is developing uh, an immunosuppressive mechanism, which is reducing the efficacy uh, of, of, of the body. And, <clears throat> and there are different ways of, of, uh, of restoring the efficacy of, uh, of the immune system. One of the system is to block the suppressive mechanism. But then you have the risk, if you block, it's like in a car, if you block the brake, then you have the risk of over speeding, which is the case. So the existing drugs actually, unfortunately, have 10 to 15 percent of patients who make overreactions, over immune reactions. So it's, it's their limitations. Or to bypass when they, uh, the mechanism, which is beginning to be the case with some of the cytokines, immunocytokines, and giving so we are attacking both aspects. So to, to answer your question, uh, yeah, efforts are made in both directions. So there will be reduced number of drugs used for treatments because I know that well, the resistance and the toxicity yeah. you find that they use protocol. Well, basically, uh, I think the governments hope so because uh, it began to be much too expensive. It's not really the case right now uh, because quite a lot of new drugs are coming on the market every year, as you see. Uh, but it may be their efficacy.
JCE they use that will eliminate some and then some will remain. Uh, the quite a lot of these drugs, especially in tyrosine kinase kind of inhibitors and things like that, are relatively cancer specific. Pretty much so. Antibodies are very cancer uh, specific also. Immunotherapy is much less cancer specific. So the, the, the very probable uh, way of treatment, I don't know if this can, can also be thought of for antibiotic variation, uh, says <clears throat> it will be a combination of treatments, treatment that attacks the part of the, of the cancer with relatively cancer specific treatments and, and, and um, an immunotherapy that eradicates it. I just wanted to, to, to add that there are also a recycling group of drugs. Uh, for example, uh, drugs used to treat uh, HIV infection are now uh, in clinical trials for cancer, yeah. like in uh, Finland. Uh, vice versa, bortezom is an inhibitor of proteasome ubiquitin system. It's active against pneumocystis uh, geovetsi pneumonia and has almost the same effects as uh, is cotimoxazor. And uh, another drug, which is silopinavir, aritonavir, in Caleta, they have a lot of action against malaria, so they are indicated <coughs> those countries where malaria is endemic and HIV also. <coughs> and now, because you advanced, I want to send you a yep. and, uh, and the the uh, Omics International wanted to give you a certificate of recognition Thank for you. your effort and time Thank to you. come here and to give us this talk. And I have also a special recognition for Mr. Yoshida because he has some uh, task for tomorrow and you okay. have another okay. one Thank after you. and they let me also something uh, for you. <laughs> so now we have a break and we'll be back here at uh, 11.